Coming up today on LinkedIn News Live. What role can artificial intelligence play in fixing a broken healthcare system? We speak with the CEO of WorldQuant Predictive on how AI tools can be used to solve urgent problems across industries. Plus, that colossal cargo ship, it's finally free. All of that coming up next. Hello, I'm Devin Banerjee, and welcome back to LinkedIn News Live, where the business conversation begins with you. It's Monday, March 29th. Let's take a quick look at the top headlines professionals are discussing today. Tech Giant's headquarters begin to reopen. USPS plans for slower delivery and higher prices. And that stuck cargo ship, it's finally freed. Let's take a deeper dive into that last story and what it means for those in the industry. The ever given a colossal container ship had been stuck in the Suez Canal for the past five days. It was wedged across the shorelines of the canal and had been blocking one of the world's busiest trade routes. Here to tell us more about this story is Katie Carroll. She is Senior Managing Editor at LinkedIn News. Katie, welcome. Hi, thank you. Happy to be here. Katie, for those who have not been following the story over the past couple of days, how did that ship get stuck in the first place? I'd be surprised if anyone wasn't following this story. I think the world has never been so enthralled by a logistics and, and supply chain story. Um, but for people who uh, kind of came into this late, um, the authorities initially said that it was a combination of uh, dust, storms, and wind, um, weather related essentially. Uh, but over the weekend clarified that there could be some technical or human error. Um, now that the ship is no longer blocking the canal, it's being moved over to an area where it can undergo a technical inspection. So over these past five days, there have been many implications of this news event, implications on the economy, on trade routes. What were some of those effects? You wouldn't think that a ship blocking a fairly narrow section of water would have such a massive impact on the global economy, uh, but about 12% of global trade uh, 1 million barrels of oil and about 8% of liquefied natural gas pass through the Suez Canal every day. So it's cost about $10 billion a day while it's been blocked over the past six days or so. And supply chains were already a little bit strained because of the pandemic and, and lockdowns and business closures, et cetera, around the globe. Did this exacerbate some of those strained supply chains? Exactly. There, uh, the, the past year has seen unprecedented demand um, on the global supply chain. Um, initially, it was because of factories being closed during lockdowns. And then after that, it's been pent up consumer demand and record demand ever since. So not only has that already led to things like an increase in costs for freight and shipping, um, but this has only exacerbated that. And it's likely to affect consumers down the line. And I think the question on everyone's mind, Katie, how did they free the ship eventually? A lot of, what was the phrase they used? Pulling and towing maneuvers. Um, they also had to dig up about 20,000 tons of mud and sand. Fascinating. Well, hopefully, knock on wood, this does not happen again in the future, but uh, a really interesting story. Katie, thanks for joining us to break it down. Thank you. That was Katie Carroll, Senior Managing Editor at LinkedIn News. To see more stories like this one, check out the news module to the right of your LinkedIn home feed, or if you're on mobile, click into the search box. Now let's talk artificial intelligence. Industries across the board from healthcare to retail are increasingly harnessing the power of AI technology to generate breakthrough insights. In fact, the number of US companies reporting widespread adoption of AI has jumped during the pandemic, according to PwC, from 18% to 25%. How does this impact the future jobs landscape? And what does this mean for different industries' competitive edge? Joining us now to give us his take is AI expert, Dr. Jim Golden. He's CEO of WorldQuant Predictive. Jim, welcome to the show. Hey, Devin, how are you? Nice to see you. Jim, I wanna start with healthcare. This is one of the areas that your organization focuses on. Um, and, and a lot of people, you know, uh, talk about AI, understand that there is a promise to AI, but don't really understand how it is already implemented. So, Jim, uh, let's talk about the healthcare space. How is AI already implemented in that space and how is it performing? 
Sure, thanks. Great question. So when you think about what AI is and what AI isn't, AI really is a computational technique built uh, on a number of different kinds of approaches to thinking about data. It's been with us for a long time, but it's really accelerated quite a bit, primarily thanks to the availability of large amounts of data and also computational power. As, as you well know, the, the, the price for chips and access to, to high throughput computing has decreased you know, vastly over the last decade. So in healthcare, where AI is really making breakthroughs are places like diagnostics, so pathology, radiology, where you have a lot of images that you need to process. Um, things like uh, the ability to do R&D around uh, drug discovery. And you know, there's some wonderful companies that are looking at how they can bring in advanced machine learning access to data to better find drugs, which is, you know, obviously an arduous and expensive process. You know, really where AI has the full promise for healthcare is to reduce cost, reduce errors, and actually bring novel sorts of innovation. It's not trivial. It's certainly not easy. And there's a lot still to be done, but there's a lot of really nice progress that's been made over the last decade. As you know, Jim, healthcare is a very personal space. There are privacy concerns. People's health is on the line. How does the industry uh, ensure that as AI is being developed and adopted, tr uh, you know, trust is being built into that process? Yeah, this is a really big deal. I mean, obviously there's regulatory and legal frameworks, right? Things like HIPAA. And we spend a lot of time thinking about where data comes from, how to get access to the data, and then what to do about that. Um, you know, we work closely as do a lot of companies with patient advocate groups. I mean, it's really important for the patients to feel they have buy-in. Uh, patients and people in general feel very, you know, funny about how their data gets collected and used. So it's very important that both transparency and trust in how that data is collected and used um, become part of the broader conversation. So when we think about the opportunity for really bringing, you know, new cures, new treatments, decreased cost and better outcomes, where data, patient data is valuable, it's an aggregate, right? So one particular patient's electronic medical record is certainly valuable, but when you have tens of thousands of those patients together, that's where things become really super valuable. Uh, and again, it, it's, a, it's, it's how we not only work with policymakers and regulatory bodies, but also bringing in the patient to understand what we're doing, why that data is important, how that data is used and protected. That, that's where I think we actually get to real progress. Absolutely. Let's take a moment to say hi to some viewers joining us in the stream. We have Gary from Nevada, Jim from Canada, Maria from Florida, Nicholas from South Africa, people from all over the world tuning in for this conversation. Reminder to those joining, if you have questions for Jim, again, he's the CEO of WorldQuant Predictive. He's an expert in all things AI. Let us know and we'll do our best to get those answered for you. Jim, you mentioned working across the spectrum with um, regulators, uh, policymakers. You mentioned the promise of AI for lowering costs in the healthcare system. You, you know, I think um, it, it, it's, it's not a stretch to say the system in the United States is quite broken. How much can AI solve that? So, you know, it's funny when you were showing the previous story, I was thinking, you know, healthcare is kind of like a ship stuck in the Suez and maybe technology is a small uh, ditch digger. Uh, I mean, that's a little bit of an exaggeration, but, um, you know, healthcare is a very difficult problem. It, it's a big thing, right? And I'm a technologist, so I'm a techno optimist. I believe there's a lot of things we can do, but, but again, when we think about what's broken, it's about payment methods, it's about cost, it's about outcomes, it's about how patients feel engaged, it's about equity in the healthcare system. I mean, so for me, where healthcare and, and the people I work with, it's how do we make better decisions? Anytime there's a lot of data, how do we find patterns in data that says this is a drug that's working, this is an outcome that's too expensive? How do we think about you know looking at the sum total of how healthcare is you know not only in the United States, but globally, and what that means for things like pandemic prediction, right? I mean, COVID-19 gave us not only urgency, but opportunity to think about where technology and data could actually bring solutions to people, whether it's how do we optimize PPE distribution? How do we think about vaccine rollout? How do we speed time for vaccine development or even drug repurposing? So again, I'm very optimistic, but you know, working against some of those things like regulatory frameworks, it, it takes a lot more than just technology. Jim, I'm glad you mentioned the pandemic. The pandemic unfortunately stalled the progress of a lot of business trends. Did it do that for AI's progress I, or did it accelerate it? I think it accelerated. I, I won't say there's a silver lining, but I think the sense of urgency and also collaboratively 
um, how we look at data, how we gather data, how we share data, right? So you think about healthcare like any other industry, data is a valuable asset. So people tend to be kind of loath to share their data across different organizations, even across health organizations, large academic medical centers. So how that data got shared, how people began building models collaboratively, how we sort of shared ideas and sort of approaches to looking at data and finding patterns. I mean, the companies like Pfizer, Moderna, J&J &J, and others, and also those who are actually repurposing drugs, Gilead, some of the pharma companies, and how we treat and share information. That's an opportunity for data evidence and artificial intelligence. Jim, we, we, we have a very specific question from a viewer on the stream, but I think it's a good one. Sarah asks, um, why do you think the chatbots in the, in the healthcare system, she's interacted with some with healthcare companies. Why do you think those chatbots are so poorly trained, she says? She says they can only recognize a very very few specific inputs. They don't seem very attuned to the way that people actually speak or ask for things. She wonders if this is maybe affected by HIPAA or, or, or um, other frameworks. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. That's a great question. Uh, so when you think about chatbots, those come under an area in AI called NLP or natural language processing. And quite honestly, you know, where AI is really good, especially things like machine learning, is in structured data. Obviously, when you have a conversation with a physician or a help desk, that's pretty unstructured. And, and so our ability to actually read random words and build dictionaries. I'll, I'll tell you though, it's getting a lot better. There's a there's a particular kind of approach called deep learning, which Google has been really fantastic in piloting. If you've ever used Google Translate on your computer, those kind of technologies are now being brought into Chatbox. I think you're gonna see them get a lot better. Uh, Chatbox tend to be something called supervised training for the most part, which is, you know, we have to, we have to build a data set. So every possible thing you could ask a chatbot about your healthcare or access to a provider, th there's a lot of diversity in that. And so the more data we can get, the more times you use it, I hate to say this, Sarah, but the more you use it, the better it gets. I know that's a little exhausting, but I think you're gonna see a lot of improvements just even over the next 18 months. Let's talk about some, some additional industries, Jim. Which other industries are most suited, do you think, for AI to play a, a differentiated role and which may be least suited? Yeah, I, you know, I tell you, when I think of the two that are most likely to be disrupted over the next three to five years, it's not only healthcare, but believe it or not, tax and audit. I mean, to be a little controversial, and you know, and I spent 10 years as a consultant, I think management consulting will be greatly disrupted over the next 10 years uh, by AI. When you think about my ability to look at data, build models, come up with evidence for decision making, if I can figure out what's the best course of action for a business, why do I need you know, a large global management consulting? Likewise with tax and audit, I, I think finance is an area. But clearly, you know, things like robotics, things like uh, agriculture are being uh, improved and disrupted by AI. So I think there's not a single industry. I'm thinking about transportation at the moment. Maybe if we had an AI piloting that uh, ship in the Suez, we wouldn't have had this incident. Maybe. Uh, <laughs> but again, I, I, think, I think every industry will be touched by this over the next three to five years. Now, Jim, you've used this word several times, disrupted and mm -hmm. disruption. I think what's on a lot of viewers' minds and, and people's mind generally is what does this mean for my job potentially? Sure. Or what does this mean for the jobs of the future? Can I retrain or reskill to work side by side with AI technology? What is your take on the implications of the jobs of the future? Yeah, that's a really important question. So again, I said before, I'm an optimist, right? I'm especially a technology optimist. Um, I, I'm not gonna say run out there and get a computer science degree or learn how to code. I think where people will work side by side with improved automated systems and even AI and machine learning chat box and other things, it's really developing a computational mindset. I don't mean having to go out and learn computer science or mathematics, but it's thinking very deeply about how evidence and data get used to make decisions. I mean, we say in my company, everyone is a modeler. And what I mean by that is every time you go out, you have an interaction with someone, you go shopping, you recognize patterns. Humans are very good at pattern recognition. AI really enhances that ability. So I think the skill set is really sort of just understanding how patterns and models and evidence and data get used in every decision-making aspect of a business. So whether you're an English major, or whether you're a music major, or whether you're a philosophy major, or a mathematician, an engineer, or a healthcare professional, I think you're going to work side by side with different augmented AI systems over the next three to five years. And I think it's just keeping that open mind and thinking about how you bring computation and data to any decision you make. Th those are the real skills you'll need. Let's say hi to some more viewers joining us in the stream. Tina from New York, John from Michigan, Suzanne from Arizona, and Teddy from Germany. Uh, Teddy is uh, ha has a great question that I have as well. 
Jim, your organization operates globally. What are some countries or geographies that you think are, are just doing this well? I'll tell you, it's great. I mean, I've been very fortunate over the last three years in my role as CEO to visit a lot of sites around the world. Um, we love Budapest. Hungarians are really, really good at mathematics and computer science. Eastern Europe, but also Singapore, China. We, we have wonderful people in Vietnam. Um, we also have great people in South Africa, South America. You know, my my uh, the founder of our company, Igor Tolchinsky, says that talent is global, opportunity is not. And we've really tried to capture that. And so when you think about the power of ubiquitous technology, ubiquitous data and AI, I think every country is going to have something to add to this. And, and for us, the diversity of people and how we think differently about problem solving, that's where you can remove bias from AI systems. I think it's about having people from all kinds of cultural and national backgrounds working together on solving big, important problems. So, you know, again, for us, Budapest is fantastic. Bucharest is fantastic. I spent a lot of time in Singapore and Vietnam is amazing. So I, I think everywhere on the planet has an opportunity to contribute. I'm glad you mentioned biases, Jim. We have seen a couple applications early on in AI's uh, evolution where biases uh, were captured and then, and then propagated by the technology. You mentioned the importance of diversity of the people working on the technology. Is, is this still a challenge, do you think? You know, it is a challenge, but I mean, for me, again, ever optimist, I think it's actually pretty straightforward to address. It's, it's not that these systems or data sets for training or testing are purposely biased. It's we are all biased as humans based on our culture, our background, our ethnicity, our socioeconomic background. The more people we bring into problem solving, the more people we bring together to create data, make observations and build models, the more you reduce the likelihood of bias. I don't see anything insidious. I mean, maybe there is, but for me, it's just the more people you can bring into problem solving and work collaboratively on how we build these AI systems, how we build the data and gather the data to train, that's where we remove bias. And then we won't have these problems in the future. Jim, we talked about trust earlier um, and we have a viewer, uh, Amit, who's saying he begs to differ that consulting will be disrupted by AI. He says it, it's a trust-based business, a relationship-based business. And AI may take a while to establish that trust. He says perhaps simpler routines, uh, reports, predictive models, et cetera, can be handled by the algorithms. Is that what you meant about disrupting consulting? I, I mean, you yourself worked as a consultant for a long time. You know the importance of relationships and trust. Yeah. Is that going to be a, an example where AI works side by side with humans? You know, Alma makes a great point. So really, it's how these things get rolled out, which will require consultants, right? So you're trust-based and relationship-based selling and delivery is very important. Again, I was very fortunate to be a consultant at Accenture and PwC for many years, where I think disruption doesn't mean elimination, but it means thinking about if I have to employ 100,000 you know, junior consultants to do tax and audit, and I can replace many of them with a system that does automated audit on tax returns, you're gonna disrupt the industry. How that's delivered, the messaging, I think domain experts, you know, even in my practice now, the company I'm building, uh, we think about how we build systems for people in CPG or healthcare or energy. Really, you have to have trusted product delivery managers, and we bring in consultants for that. So disrupted does not mean elimination. I think it means just a new way of working. One thing we can uh, consistently see in the news uh, these days, Jim, unfortunately, are governance challenges at companies, issues with boards of directors, issues with uh, management teams, um, lots of problems in that realm. I was, I was listening yesterday to, to an interview you did recently where you talked about AI applications in corporate governance. And I found that really interesting because again, it's in the news, but big investors are very curious about this. Sure. They've added ESG factors, the G right. standing for governance to their um, investment models. What are some applications in, in, in that area? Sure. So, I mean, if you think again, what I said about what AI is good at and it's finding patterns, which is also what humans are good at, right? We just maybe do it a little faster using computation. So when I think about governance, it's how do I look for patterns that might lead to an outlier that could be a mistake or misbehavior, right? So when I think about how, if, if we set metrics for ourselves that will be sustainable, that we'll invest in green technologies, having systems that look for patterns, that analyze all the data, that integrate data and bring hypotheses back to boards of directors. This allows us just to have a bigger lens and a larger telescope for how we think about you know, compliance. I, I, I think you know, one of the first places that AI and machine learning really had an impact was on fraud, right? So whether it's banking fraud or credit card fraud, 
these same kinds of ideas can be applied to boards of governance to think about, are we meeting our equity and diversity goals? Are we meeting our sustainability goals? It's just another tool for giving us more productivity and, and, and bigger and faster outreach. I think about it as scale, I think about it as cost, I think about it as speed, right? So let's just say anything we wanna be able to do can be assisted by these technologies by doing it at scale faster and hopefully cheaper. Yeah, that's gonna be really interesting to watch. Jim, we have a great question in the stream from Joshua. He asks, he says, I'm curious about Jim's perspective on AI in creative industries. Have you seen mm, any yes. interesting applications in, 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 in those more creative interest industries? Yeah, I mean, my first thought, great great question, Joshua, is, you know, uh, I mean, for me, my first thought is, can we get them to accurately price NFTs, right? So that's a whole different <laughs> segment for you guys to talk about on LinkedIn. You know, I, I'm a musician, obviously, you can see some of my guitars in the background. A lot of people are using AI to generate music. Uh, some of that's pretty interesting. Um, I, I mean, I think, again, if you think about augmented intelligence or AI for helping us think or do things at scale, uh, I've got some wonderful musician friends that use a lot of technology, again, to find patterns in music. Um, for me, we're a long way, I think, from having creative AI. Uh, you know, again, when we think about AI as being specialized, meaning things we build for a particular task, like reading an MRI in healthcare, versus, you know, general AI, which is passing the Turing test and imitating humans. I think we're, we're a very long way away from general AI, and likewise, a long way from creative endeavors. I mean, for me, you know, as an amateur musician, and a great lover of music and art, I, I I look for that human experience and how it speaks to me. Haven't seen it yet in technology. Doubt I will, but I could be proved wrong. That's that, that's also a super interesting area to watch. And I'll be curious yourself as a musician uh, whether you adopt you know some of that AI technology in in in, in how you perform, how you write music going forward. Uh, that will be super interesting. Okay. So Jim, if we were to uh, talk a year from now, three years from now, maybe five years from now, what do you think we'll be talking about in terms of AI's progress? Will this conversation have 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 leapfrogged forward and we'll be talking about many more applications, do you think? I, I mean, I think so. I, I think hopefully we'll talk about chatbots being better, right? I'm, I'm hoping to be <laughs> right on that in the next 18 to 24 months. And again, that's just a matter of practice and training. Um, you know, transportation is an area where we finally solve the self-driving car application. I mean, we're good. We're not perfect. We'd be better. Um, every time I watch a booster from SpaceX land, I think, you know, that's AI. That's pretty good. Can my Volvo do the same kind of thing? I think again, in medicine, if we can work through governance compliance issues, I think you'll see many more improvements in things like diagnostics. But again, you know, uh, AI-based drug discovery, improvement of outcomes, precision medicine, which is really how we understand right drug, right patient, right time, right therapy. Um, I mean, I think I think the progress will be very, very fast. You know, to quote my favorite author, William Gibson, he has a saying that the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. I think AI is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. Maybe in two to three years, we'll see it much more evenly distributed. It seems like given all the applications you're talking about that are still not yet um, you, you know, happening, it seems like we're in very early innings though. We are, you know, and again, what I worry about is we tend to overpromise and underdeliver on things like big technology. But at the same time, there's a lot of organizations. I like to think the one I lead, but there's, you know, there's, there's dozens, if not hundreds of wonderful small companies, both in Silicon Valley and, and in New York City. And then again, around the world, places like Hungary, Romania, Vietnam, Singapore, South America, where people are building really interesting applications. They're going after these really difficult business and societal problems. Pandemic prediction is one of them. We're very fortunate to participate with a lot of different groups that are thinking about pandemic prediction. Can Could we have predicted um, the COVID virus? Could we have predicted how it would have spread? Could we have done a better job on the supply chain getting PPE to frontline healthcare workers who need it? I, I'm, I'm hopeful, I'm very hopeful uh, that we will actually see these techniques being used to really improve basically every aspect of the human condition. Well, Jim, we could probably talk about this for hours. In fact, we have many more great questions in the stream, but unfortunately we have to leave it there. I want to thank you for your time today. Thank you. My pleasure, Devin. Thanks for having me and thanks to the audience. That was Dr. Jim Golden. He's CEO of WorldQuant Predictive. And don't forget to join us tomorrow for a discussion on the evolving role of communities. We'll be speaking with Nextdoor CEO, Sarah Fryer, about the importance of connections a year into this global health crisis. I'm Devin Banerjee. Thanks again for watching LinkedIn News Live.